Good evening and welcome to the Cleminger Auditorium for tonight's uh, very special Wheeler Centre National Gallery of Victoria event. I'm Michael Williams, Director of the Wheeler Centre. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge we're on the lands of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders of any other communities who are with us tonight. It's customary at these things to begin by listing the various achievements of the guest. Uh, but with this evening's guest, those achievements are many and varied. I'll try and list them with a sense of escalation to the most important. Um, let's see where to begin. Uh, in his 20s, he became an uh, art critic for the age. Uh, at the age of 31, he became Foundation Professor of Fine Arts at Monash University. In his late 30s, he became the director of this august institution. Um, Patrick McCacky doesn't really need to be introduced to an audience in Melbourne who loves Australian art and believes in Australian art. Uh, he, uh, after all of that, uh, he went to the US where he became director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum, uh, chair in Australian studies at Harvard University and director of the Yale Centre for British Art. He's the author of countless books uh, and he is most importantly of all my uncle. Um, <laughs> which obviously is his most sterling achievement to date. Uh, it's no small thing being the nephew of Patrick McCackie, uh, and he inspired in me a great passion for the arts and culture, and in particular the ways in which Australian art and culture engages in many varied traditions that come before it. Uh, alongside my grandparents, my mother, my other aunts and uncles, my cousins, he was a direct inspiration to me in wanting to be a member of a community that gives back to the arts and works in a cultural institution. And I hope that in everything uh, that I do at the Wheeler Centre, Patrick's influence uh, is immediately visible. Uh, I'm going to introduce him now. That's it. That's just about all I have to say, except this. Patrick will give a lecture today. And following that lecture, he will take your questions, but only if they're intelligent ones. So please don't let us, uh, let us down. Uh, Patrick also wrote a memoir uh, that came out a few years ago called The Bright Shapes and the True Names. It took its title from a Vin Buckley poem and the line before Bright Shapes and the True Names is to be in constant pilgrimage to the bright shapes and the true names. Uh, and there is a sense in which Patrick's whole career has been one of constant pilgrimage uh, to understand this extraordinary, strange country of ours and to ask the question, why Australian painting matters? Please welcome Patrick McCaggy. Well. Michael Williams, thank you very much indeed. Um, when Michael was speaking, it, it reminded me that almost of a fortune cookie. You know, you get them at the end of Chinese dinners and you break up the thing and the fortune cookie says, he is a fortunate man who has a clever nephew. <laughs> um, before I start, I'd just like to pay a particular tribute uh, to two very uh, generous Melbourne patrons of the arts who at a critical moment came to my aid and gave very generous gifts uh, to uh, Melbourne University Press so that the book could be as brilliantly and fully illustrated as it is. And those patrons are Mark and Eva Beeson and Peter and Joan Clemenger. And um, the book would be nothing of what it is uh, if it were not for their generous and timely in in intervention. And I remain eternally grateful to them. You should be very careful, can I just give you a warning, about putting into the title a claim which sounds like a question. Because it opens the way to every smart aleck over the last few years to say, so why does it matter, Patrick? Or have you come up with the answer yet? <laughs> and uh, I was struck as they were kind of being queried about this by a wonderful line by W. H. Jordan, which says, how do I know what I think till I see what I say? And it has been over the last four or five years, I think I've, you have an evolving view as to why Australian painting matters. And let me put it to you just very simply first. Australian painting matters because it is at the centre of the creation of an Australian consciousness. It's a sense of what it's like. They, the painters have given us a sense of what it's like to live and exist in, in Australia, particularly in the landscape and the varieties of the Australian landscape from the bush to the pastoral littoral, from the desert to the shore, um, be it rocky shore or surf beach. And a sense of giving, a sense of valuing those landscapes in which we live and in which we all take such deep uh, ple 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 pleasure. 
and not just the landscape, but the cities of Australia have been the source of some extraordinary painting uh, in, in, in Australia. And indeed, the nature, they've actually focused sometimes the nature of Australian cities, which I think are quite remarkable for their size and their sophistication. And one of the things which makes it, the city so remarkable is, of course, that they're all capital cities, which gives a sense of focus, centrality to what happens will be within them. The best talents gather in the city, in the kind of the mill. And you know, I've sometimes described Melbourne and Sydney as being the last of the great Italian city-states. The gates are closed at about 2 a.m. in the morning, and then they open again at 5 a.m. to let the market gardeners in, uh, and the city life begins. And just in the city, the great city-states of uh, Renaissance uh, Italy, what gave those states such tremendous power, both artistically and financially, was that this boiling mass of people striving competitively with, within it to outdo do each other. And that, I think, is often the characteristic of what happens in Australian cities, particularly Melbourne and Sydney. But they're capital cities. And, my God, if you saw some of the capitals of the states in America, you would shudder. I mean, um, try Harrison, Pennsylvania, uh, or Augusta, Maine, or even Albany, New York, and they really belong to the walking wounded uh, of urban uh, centres. And so, but perhaps when one says that the creation of an Australian consciousness, one wonders if that is such an exceptional claim. It's a claim that uh, many people could make, or indeed have made, uh, for the significance and importance of Australian painting and painters. But over the kind of evolution of writing this book, what struck me again and again was what a comprehensive view in almost every stage of uh, Australian painting uh, from the early 19th century on, what a comprehensive vision they have of the nature of Australia and its imparting uh, into creating a kind of consciousness for us. Um, uh, it is uh, one in which uh, there is almost no period in which you don't feel that the central issues in Australian life have not been confronted by the, the, uh, by the, the, the painters. Um, and in a way, you could say, well, isn't that true of almost any national school? It's just not. I mean, in American painting, uh, it begins with the great, the 19th century begins with a great, I mean, after you've got through a painful thing called American colonial portraiture, uh, which really um, uh, can um, cause brain damage if uh, exposed to too much. Um, uh, once you get to the 19th century and the rise of the Hudson River School, Everything seems to be going along splendidly. It's you know, manifest destiny, the great possibilities of uh, America opening up. But that vision got absolutely cut off at the knees by the American Civil War in the 1860s. Great painting happened after that, but it was never indeed a consciousness creating um, a function. It's really the great writers of America, um, from Emerson to Whitman uh, in the 19th century in the novel, from Hawthorne uh, to Henry James, which really create American consciousness. And the one great school, which of course does perfectly mirror the consciousness uh, and create the consciousness of a nation, is French painting. French painting of the 19th century from David and Delacroix to Courbet and Manet and the Impressionists, of course, creates the consciousness which makes France such a dynamic culture in the 19th century. But when I say Australian painting does that too, we're comparing it to one of the greatest periods in Western art, which is French art, in the 19th century. So it's remarkable that Australian painting has played such a dominant and important role in the shaping of Australian consciousness. Let me tell you a small story. I, I'm repeating a, a story I've used in public before, but um, let me know, because it just gives the kind of concrete um, uh, evidence of what I'm trying to, to say about the creation of Australian consciousness. Mm, excellent gin. Wow, the Wheeler Centre knows how to do these things. Um, uh, years ago, uh, Sir Joseph Burke, the much beloved, very distinguished uh, British historian, the first Herald Professor of Fine Arts at the University of Melbourne, once jokingly complained to me that ever since you, after you arrived in 1946, uh, he couldn't see the Australian countryside at all. Because everywhere he drove, all he saw were Russell Drysdale, right, left, everywhere. And all he could see was Russell Drysdale. And he told me he was just getting over that when a fellow called Fred Williams came along, and then all he saw, wherever he went, were Fred, Fred, Fred Williamses. <laughs> 
And in a funny, amusing way, that's exactly what the creation of consciousness is. We see, perceive, um, we experience. Uh, we have been enriched by our experience by um, the quality um, of Australian painting. And let me start with the first really sophisticated painting uh, ever painted uh, in oil uh, of Australia. It's painted by an Englishman, William Westall, who accompanied Matthew Flinders on his circumnavigation of Australia in 1802. The picture's a wonderful title. A view in Sir Edward Pellew's group, Gulf of Carpentaria, discovered by Captain Matthew Flinders, 1802. And it has, I think, at the very beginnings of Australia, the image of the kind of the barren paradise, brilliant and remote. And you feel its brilliance and you feel its remoteness from almost any other source of land uh, or, or, or place. But he also does something which is very interesting. He shows from the very beginning that Australia was not terra nullius. Because the focus which falls upon him is in the middle of that humpy which you see, which is of course uh, by indigenous people, and uh, holds or shrines a ranga, uh, a sacred stone. And so here is the kind of very beginnings, if you like, of the creation of consciousness. And for many people, Australia was a kind of barren paradise, and its remoteness was one of the things which you experienced and felt, felt most. Alas, this picture is not a part of an Australian collection. Because the Royal Navy paid for Matthew Flinders' circumnavigation of Australia, they took all the paintings as well. And this painting is now, can you believe it, in the Department of Defence art collection in London and is much too good for them. <laughs> um, but just to show you quickly now how much um, the painters played this role of shaping consciousness. John Glover, who is the first really sophisticated um, uh, 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 painter to come to Australia and to make paintings. Now Glover, as you probably all know, was a remarkably mediocre painter uh, in, in England in the 1820s. And you there's no well, more mediocre than the mediocre English painter of the 1820s. I mean, he's <laughs> the dullest of the dull. And believe me, I've seen many of them. Um, uh, and yet when he comes to Australia, he actually renews himself. The challenge of the land transforms him as an artist. And as my friend David Hansen says, he kind of sheds the shackles of a kind of Claudian view of nature and really begins to tackle nature head on. And I want to sort of show you how much he shows one of the very central arguments, the central difficulties of early Australia. And that is the presence and the absence of indigenous people. Glover was very sympathetic to the indigenous people. He aligned himself with the liberal wing, if one can call that, uh, small l liberal, uh, in Tasmania, who sought really to have a, had a very respectful view, admiring view uh, of the um, indigenous people and did not want to see them um, uh, wiped out as they virtually were. And in this great picture, the view of Hobart Town and Mount Wellington from Kangaroo Point, the Aborigines straggle across the foreground uh, and you can see almost a whole succession of things, of hunters returning, the beginnings of the celebration of a corroboree, and then in the Derwent River itself, you see them enjoying fishing as well as simply swimming. They are the people who are perfectly at home in this land landscape. They can live on it, they can live happily on it, and that shows them at play. Of course, uh, Glover knew that, that was, they did not have a happy fate in store for them, and they are kind of shrouded in the sort of shaded area in the foreground. And the inevitable future is in bright sunlight as uh, the town of Hobart nestles at the very foot of Mount, Mount Wellington. So here is the presence of indigenous people. And we admire the dignity and care with which Glover has painted them and the kind of beautiful tableau as they move from left to right uh, across, across the work. But I suppose what Glover is we cherish him most for are these great pastoral panoramas which he painted uh, in uh, Tasmania, in and around uh, where, where he lived in the, in the Midlands uh, of Tasmania. This is Kaywood on the Owls. And there's a sort of extraordinary beauty to the landscape in which one sees this valley suddenly become a kind of fecund, fertile, fertile, fertile world which has got fences uh, and su supports stock uh, and grows, grows crops uh, and is a kind of almost an image 
of uh, pastoral serenity, a kind of carved uh, out of the wild, uh, which you see at the background. But of course, what's absent, what's strikingly absent from this picture is that there's not one indigenous person left within it. Because inevitably, the process of settling and of growing crops and establishing farms would be to push Aboriginal people off their, their, off their lands. And I think today for us, it's a picture of great puzzlement. We love the beauty and the expansiveness, the sense of real air and light which Glover gets into the landscape, and yet we know that it's underpinned by a terrible sense of human cost. For the very first painters, I think, and indeed for Australians in the uh, early first half of the 19th century, the great dialogue in their mind was between the wild and the settled. And indeed, most very early painting concentrates on the settled and the enormous pride which Australians had on how quickly the settlements took hold from kind of foothold to handhold to people actually standing up and actually being able to live uh, in Port Jackson, later Sydney, and in Hobart, and eventually, of course, in Melbourne. And the settled and the wild was a sort of interior dialogue within people. And here you see this kind of wonderful Conrad Martins of a view of Sydney from Rosebank. And already you can see that the North Shore is busily taking its proper shape. Uh, it's dotted with a wonderful kind of wild parkland, but a parkland, not a kind of frightening wild, and it's dotted with Georgian mansions. These indeed were the patrons uh, of uh, Conrad Martins, and he leaves nothing uh, to be uh, desired in how he depicts the houses of his patrons. And that very beautiful part in the foreground of the picture, you can see a painter's materials. And it's as though the painter has stopped depicting a particular house and stepped back so he can get the whole scene of the kind of delicious bush, that kind of great park, and the settlement within it. It's like the high moment of optimism uh, for settlement um, uh, in uh, Australia. Three years later, the surveyor of uh, South Australia, E.C. Frome, painted and talented artist himself, painted this extraordinary picture. It's called The South Desert Called Lake Torrens. And surely that's ironic, because there's not a scrap of water to be seen. It's the absolute minimum landscape. It is the wild beyond anybody's wildest expectations. And the other terrible irony is that the man on horseback raises a telescope to his eye to survey nothing, an absolute sense of total emptiness in the landscape, the very polar opposite to what um, uh, one saw in the Con Conrad Martins. So here, Australian painting, right at the start, takes hold of kind of quite crucial issues which will really vex the mind. People knew that there was a very great possibilities in the land, in the great pastoral leases of Victoria and New South Wales, and they knew there was a world without, a barren, difficult, strange, and dangerous world. But in the 1840s, it was the beginning of the great move of to explore Central Australia to the great transcontinental um, uh, uh, courses of uh, investigation. Then when one comes to the later 19th century, one sees in the Heidelberg School, Australian Impressionism, an extraordinary way in which the quite central experiences of Australians were made the subject of art. Arrivals and departures, we might call this. Everybody in Australia had this experience which you see in the great picture Coming South by Tom Roberts. Everybody was a boat person uh, in the 19th century. And there they were cooped up uh, uh, on board, probably slightly overcrowded, and which you never had a sense of seeing the sea of being free at all because the lifeboats blocked you and the big um, uh, ven ven ventilator shafts came roaring up and you were constricted. It's the, it's the rite of passage uh, of coming uh, to Australia. And he shows the kind of variety of people coming. The two semi-fashionably dressed girls on the uh, right-hand side deliberately contrast with the figures here who are dressed in widow's weeds. And of course, Tom Roberts, uh, when he came to Australia with his mother, his mother was in fact a widow. So this picture is a very personal element as well. And you can see nestling in the bottom here is a boy. And he's erecting a house of cards. And that's a rather kind of grim, ironic note, 
to the expectation of these migrants, potential settlers coming, of building a house of cards for, where, for uh, what they're doing in their minds, of growing rich quickly uh, in, uh, in Australia. But how unheroic that writer passage is, in, as, uh, as Roberts shows it. And then its great answering picture is departures, and the melancholy of departures. This is Charles Condor's wonderful uh, steamship SS Orient uh, leaving um, uh, from uh, Circuit of Quay uh, in Sydney. And of course, he even gives it English weather to add to the sense of nostalgia, returning to the beloved home country. And they called it home, God knows, right down uh, into the 1960s and uh, 70s even. And so arrival and departure were absolutely essential experiences. And what one sees emerging now, particularly in the Heidelberg School, is that what they painted was experienced by everybody else in that society. So the paintings made an instant connection with their, their, their audience. And it's really proven by the fact that the trustees of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, never known for their enlightenment, believe you me, in 150 years, uh, were to purchase this painting immediately because it exactly rang the right bell, the tremendous nostalgia of departing. Seeing your friends depart to going backwards, back to the country where you half longed always maybe uh, to, to be. And it wasn't just landscapes, I said, it was the city. That was the central part of the Australian experience. Marvis Melbourne, as Tom Roberts shows it in Burke Street, 12 o'clock, Allegro con Brio, was a sort of, didn't focus on the kind of great edifices, the banks, the law courts, which Melbourne had already built by the time he painted uh, the, the, this painting uh, in the uh, mid-1880s. It was the bustle, the thriving commercial liveliness of Melbourne, which he focused upon us. It's the kind of painting of modern life, in which the bustle of life goes on, and that becomes the subject of the work, something you could easily identify with. And how right he was to paint the centre of Melbourne from what would now be a mirror, uh, a window in Myers. Um, and that was the great sort of, uh, really, the experience which anybody could have had, even to the point of adding, I think slightly unfortunately, these girls from PLC with their mother out for a day shopping. And I always thought if he hadn't added them and this was all left blank, it would look even better. But what affluence he shows too. Look at the line of cabs going right down Burke Bur Street, waiting for all this kind of great swell and melee of people to take them and go to their um, houses and uh, po posh places. But was it that the true Australia, that the extraordinary achievement of marvellous Melbourne in the 1880s and 90s? Or was it, as Streeton would have it, the eternal promise of the land still glides the stream and shall forever glide, as he called this painting, as though the great serenity which he found in the Yarra Valley, looking out towards the blue of the Dandenongs, that was a place of continuous potential hope, renewal. So these are kind of deeply consciousness-raising and shaping uh, pictures in which you see your experience mirrored and reflected back by, by the artists uh, of, of, of your time. And one of the great discoveries of the Heidelberg School was the domain of the beach. And in Tom Roberts' paints in the camp at uh, Mentone, two great contrasting images of the beach. S S Sunny South, which you see here, is indeed the male-dominated land landscape in which the male nude um, appears uh, for the first time um, uh, in Australian painting. And it's almost in which men suddenly, they stand and they're free. That great gesture of the central figure where he stands and raises his arms above his head, a kind of moment of real exaltation at being free in the kind of warm summer air uh, down at Sandringham. And I love it, standing, sitting, and this chap rather nervously going into the water where he's going to be more exposed than he is in this uh, particular part of the beach. And Roberts wants to underscore the point that this is no fantasy. These aren't fawns or nymphs um, uh, in a wood because he puts that little tongue of Ricketts Point 
like a wonderful middle ground, holding the middle ground so, so beautifully through it. And of course, Ricketts Point made an enormous amount to them because it was on Ricketts Point that very summer that Fred McCubbin and Tom Roberts came across a young man with red hair painting the landscape en plein air whose name was Arthur Streeton. This is the male world in which you feel free and strong and at ease with the world. And then Roberts would paint, almost jeek by jar within months, this really beautiful, rather somber picture of Mentone, in which it is women who stand as the dominant element, in which the beach or the shore is seen as a place of perfect security for them simply relaxing for the day without the need for the men are all tucked in under the lid of that, under the gun, gun wall, uh, the gunnel of, uh, of the boat uh, on the right on the right hand side. It's the women who really animate and dramatize the scene. And so the beach is seen as being equally democratic for both use of both men and women. And this is long before uh, art historians learned to speak of the gendered place and the gendered landscape, uh, which is one of the less uh, pleasant developments in modern art, art historiography. <laughs> the other thing which is striking about the Heidelberg School is how often work, or the absence of work, is the theme of the painting. It is as though it must have been a common enough sight during the really very difficult times in the early 1890s and then the big depression of the middle of the 1890s, a fairly common experience for people to have come across, as Fred McCubbin did, this man, uh, a swaggy, who's obviously out of work. And yet he's quite respectable. If you look at his, he's not ragged, he has good strong boots, he has good strong hands, and his trousers aren't remarkably well. He's a working man who wants to work, who can't find work. And that work, and the absence of it, was a crucial theme. I mean, the greatest and most famous of all Heidelberg School pictures is, of course, Shearing the Rams, the great scene of labor. And here, the exact opposite of that, the sense of uh, resignation, even despondency, of the man unable to, to work. Come the dawn of the new century, there was a very good thing, which Australia became a federation. And apart from having the dreariest constitution of any new nation under the sun, it also did some great things. It was the first of the imperial uh, countries, first of the empire, to grant universal adult su suffrage. It's a very, very important uh, point. And the creation uh, of the eight-hour uh, eight work, uh, eight working week. So there were great social achievements. But there was a strangely conservative, element ran through the immediate post-Federation years. Who was the great hero of the new century and the new Federation of Australia? It was, I'm afraid to say, Hans Heysen, whom you see here. And Heysen painted this very blokey, masculine world. This picture is called Lord of the Bush. And I'm not sure whether it's the oxen, the man, or that rampant gum tree, which is the real hero of the painting. But it became a kind of stereotype. Uh, on Heysen's part, and in which, uh, for many, uh, uh, Heysen was Australian nature and it not, could never be d diverted from. And because it became so incredibly popular and successful, it was a sort of stereotype from which Heysen himself could hardly ever uh, depart. And I'm afraid the great promise sometimes of the, um, uh, of the Heidelberg School was to be rather dashed uh, in the later lives of the Heidelberg School painters. Streeton, who had tried to become an Englishman and tried to become accepted by the Royal Academy uh, f fruitlessly over many years in Britain, returned to Australia in the 20s and settled, and then decided to paint Australian beauty spots. And this is a picture called The Land of the Golden Fleece. He thought it was so good he painted it five times. The only really notable thing about the land of the Golden Fleece is that every known cliché of the Australian landscape could be contained in one painting. <laughs> the distant blue grounds, the sheep in the foreground, and reassuringly a dam so we're not in the middle of drought. All's perfect, all's well with the Australian landscape. There was one bright spot, but it was only a spot. And that was when two young artists in Sydney Roy DeMester and Roland Wakelin banded together and had one exhibition of what they called synchromonies, in which painting would be analogous to music, uh, 
And this picture by Roy Roy Demester is called Rhythmic Composition in Yellow Green Minor, with everything in the painting allied to something in the diatonic scale. It was an extraordinary painting. This was the first abstract painting painted in 1919 in Australia and remains some ways one of the very best abstract paintings ever painted in, in the country. But its history was so extraordinary. It was never shown at the time. It wasn't included in the 1919 exhibition. And it was never publicly exhibited until Daniel Thomas acquired it on the uh, nod from Bernard Smith for the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 1960, uh, almost 40 years uh, after it had been painted. Demester left Australia in 1930. Roland Wakelin uh, took up a long life of teaching and became a rather dull and plodding post-impressionist uh, after this brilliant early start. It was, if you like, a flash in the pan. The real task of bringing the modern to Australia was left to three remarkable women. And the first of these was Grace Cottington Smith, who throughout the 1920s painted a series of extraordinary scenes of Sydney. She wasn't a closeted um, a painter painting away in some uh, suburban studio. She actively engaged with the life around her. She was that most crucial thing for a painter, the painter of modern life. She painted crowded Sydney. She painted crowds at ra ra race courses, the terrible Russian scramble of the ra ra Russia uh, in Sydney and so on. And then in 1930, she paints, I think, one of the great modern pictures in Australia, which is the bridge in curve. And that great sense of aspiration as the two arms of the bridge leap towards each other exactly epitomized what the bridge meant, not just to Sydney siders, but to Australia as a whole. Here in the middle of that terrible Great Depression, there was this great public work going forward in Australia, spanning what seemed to be an unsp impossible uh, distance uh, between the two uh, sides of Sydney Harbour. And this picture has a remarkable history because she submitted it to the Society of Artists and the picture was rejected by the old men. The people who saw the bridge as a threat to old Sydney, as Lionel Lindsay did, and the man who really delivered the final cut for this painting was Sidney Ewer Smith, who himself uh, exhibited a watercolour of the bridge in construction instead. And the effect on Costin Smith was devastating. It was the role of the old man subjecting women to a really kind of uh, an appuntive way. She never painted ambitious urban scenes again. She retreats to a studio in Taramara, paints great landscapes, some beautiful still lives, and at the very end of her life will paint some of the great pictures which are the interiors uh, of her own house at Cossington. But she was somehow driven from the public realm by the old men who had taken charge of, of Australian art. And the second woman is Margaret Preston. And Preston wasn't going to be driven away by anything. She was, even in the words of the kindly Lloyd Rees, the most conceited person I have ever met. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, she, however, was the first to really look hard and take Aboriginal art seriously as a source for the Australian painter. And this picture, I lived in Barara waters, quite clearly reflects the effect of bark painting. It's sort of scouring and marking, it's kind of horror of vacui, it's compactness of composition, it's moment to moment, a change of texture uh, and, and mode. And it was a sort of a forcefulness, a sort of homegrown modernism was beginning to emerge uh, out of uh, Margaret Preston. And the third is perhaps the most touching of all. It's Clarice Beckett here in Melbourne. You probably all know the terrible story of Clarice Beckett. Um, she painted, um, she was a student of Max Meldrum, the only student of Max Meldrum were worth looking at. Uh, and then she evolved remarkably in painting in this extraordinary modern contemporary way. She painted down in Beaumaris, she painted uh, wet streets in the back streets of Beaumaris with their telegraph posts and their fire hydrants, uh, cars, um, petrol pumps and all. And uh, she lived at home. She had to look after two querulous and difficult uh, parents, and she had to nurse her mother through her final uh, sickness. And one day, um, Clara spent too long 
out in the landscape, painting pictures like this, the wet road, wet uh, beach road in wet weather, and she caught terrible pneumonia, and she died. She had exhibited annually uh, all her life. Um, she was condescended to by the critics of Melbourne, Blamar Young and Arthur Street and others. And her work was passed to her sister, who stored it in an open-sided shed in Gippsland. And when Rosalind Hollenrake, bless her, discovered this work, she rescued as much as she could, about perhaps less than half of what uh, Clarence Beck had painted. The rest had been gone to tatters in the wind and the rain. And in this picture, different from Cotton and Smith's confidence, different from uh, uh, um, uh, Margaret Preston's sheer brazen attack on the surface, it's to paint a very important aspect of Australian life, the terrible sense of loneliness, isolation were within it this kind of deserted, wet road, with only the painter having enough faith in herself to keep painting this rather beautiful, melancholic, seemingly inconsequential scene. And that sense of isolation, both in urban and in rural settings, became a great theme in Australian art. And as well known a painter as Russell Drysdale, clearly it's that sense of isolation in feeding the dogs. And Dreisel is a really remarkable figure because he came from a wealthy family, a uh, squadocracy. Um, there were big owners of pioneering sugar mills in Queensland. He was a wealthy man, uh, came from a wealthy family. He traveled in Europe extensively in the 1930s. And when he returned first to the George Bell School, he began to paint pleasant enough post-impressionist pictures. But what really made him a great painter was when he went into the sort of outback or the rural back blocks of New South Wales and northern Victoria, and he saw poverty, poverty of the 1930s. And this man, a son of a wealthy family, saw that as being the theme which he should take up, as being authentically that of what the nation is going through at this moment. And the same sense of isolation and uh, loneliness, which was there in the uh, Clarence Beckett, is surely echoed again in these kind of minimally, minimal landscapes, uh, these th stick figures who are bare survivors in a landscape which looks always as though it's in perpetual drought. But against that, against that particular view, painted almost contemporaneously with feeding the dogs, was the voice of one of Australia's greatest painters, this perhaps the most familiar modern painting in all of Australia. And instead of being about isolation, it's about heroic isolation, in which that isolation turns, no one turns the figure upon itself. The man, Ned Kelly, is now the hero uh, who, uh, the hero who um, uh, rides off into the unknown, confronting it, uncertain as to what there is, a kind of fawn-like figure, uh, who is unafraid of what he sees, the very epitome of the hero who will command what his world will deal to him. But Nolan knew a great tragic sense as well as this heroic sense, which is what made him such a great painter. And literally 20 years after he'd painted that famous Kelly, he'll paint, I think, almost the last and best of the fragments of the lost of the doomed explorer, which is a sort of fragment out of the kind of Burke and Will's tale. But in this case, it's the man, the explorer, who has to drag the camel with him, who is no longer a beast of burden or a beast that can help the man. And that terrible sense of despair and yet defiance in the upthrust gesture of the figure's uh, left, left arm. And here, the landscape is not that great promising place which Kelly drove towards, rode towards. It's a kind of landscape minimalism. It is a kind of the limits situation in which man is pushed to the very edge of being. The Australian landscape now began to develop a kind of almost a metaphysical quality in which it was a place of trial and test for the human, a place in which it was richly allegorical as a landscape, as Arthur Boyd would show in two remarkable paintings painted immediately after World War II, both of which take themes of Paradise of Eden. This is literally the Eden 
on the south coast of New South Wales. It's the boat builders. One of the most delightful and popular pictures, again, uh, in modern uh, Australian art. And it's a scene of great harmony, isn't it, in which the boat builders tend to their work, the child goes to the door of the shed, and the little pier down there looking out towards Twofold Bay is a scene of enormous serenity, of hard labour and serenity, and being encased by the landscape. And he does a very old trick in a way. He takes the kind of repoussoirs of Claude, the, the shade, the framing trees on both left-hand sides, to really focus our attention on the beauty, serenity, and the industry, which is witnessed down there in the little country, in the little fishing town then of, of Eden. And he loves the ironic gnome that the place is actually called Eden when he paints this Eden-like landscape. But he would also paint this, which of course is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden, just happens to be done on the Mornington Peninsula. And they emerge from the sort of scraggly bush uh, into this stony ground, um, uh, naked as the world. And as suddenly the Australian landscape is seen as a place in which allegory is possible. The great events of sacred history could be acted out meaningfully and plausibly in the Australian landscape. It was this rich allegorical zone. And I suppose it rises to its kind of climax virtually in about 1960 when Albert Tucker returns from overseas and paints this Antipodean head, an explorer menaced by parrots. And for many it was the epitome of the Antipodean movement, although he was never a member of the group itself. And it was the man who simply endures stoically. He's not a historical figure, he's just an epitome of what the explorer uh, must be to survive. He takes on the very character of the land, the pitted, cratered head, that of the land, landscape itself, and is menaced but survives. But for some, this kind of rather uh, allegorical, rather romanticized view of the landscape was becoming increasingly implausible. And in Melbourne, the remarkable figure of Fred Williams painted this picture in Sherbrooke Forest exactly a year after that painting by Albert Tucker. You try sliding an outlaw or a doomed explorer into this picture. No way. It's airless, tight as a drum. It's just that brilliant play of light falling down vertically through the bush. And it becomes just a series of fragments with no horizon line, no baseline at all, just that extraordinary mesh of light falling down uh, through the branches and trunks of the forest. And in Sydney, his near contemporary, John Olson, was not going to have the allegorical, it was a sort of phantasmagorical world in which we would paint a kind of wonderful view of Sydney called the entrance to the seaport city of desire. Every Melbourneian's view as to what Sydney's really like. <laughs> and uh, one sees the, the swirl of the harbour, the inlets and so on, the rambunctiousness as though Luna Park had been loosed upon, upon, the, upon the world. But Williams and Olsen both would later in their careers be drawn to the great inland country of the outback. Fred Williams in his last great series on the Pilbara. And here in this marvellous picture simply called Red Landscape, it's hard to know almost what is atmosphere, what is substance. Uh, they blend together in this extraordinary glowing red with just minimal markings, that extraordinary austere geometry of land and sky, just scattered uh, gum trees uh, across it. And it is as though it has a refulgence to it, a kind of beauty to it, uh, which we can admire. It's not, and deliberately not, a sublime view that Sid Nolan had of the interior. It's one in which the sheer beauty and power of the land and the form and the atmosphere it generates held the viewer. And how remarkable for a moment, just to think that it was painted only seven years before the emergence of Ro 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 Robert Thomas as one of the great contemporary painters of Australia. I suppose there was no greater revolution in Australian art and taste than the emergence of contemporary Aboriginal art, starting with Jeff Barton at the Papunya settlement and rapidly spreading to numerous um, uh, indigenous settlements across uh, Australia, in which they recovered their, their dreamings. And by recovering their dreamings, their place in the world, 
they gave us a profounder understanding of our land than we have ever had before. Before 1970, few of us could have given a good and adequate account of what the dreaming was, that perpetual myths of creation in which you stand forever there, in which eventually when you die, you go back into the dreaming itself, leaving your mark upon the country. And the sheer valuing of the landscape for itself, a place which they had to know how to survive in, which is why uh, again and again, contemporary Aboriginal, the dreamings return to sources of water, to sources of food in which you can survive in this most barren of, of uh, landscapes. The Outback Desert is exactly what W.H. Auden once described, a place where no subscription concerts are given and there is nothing for lunch. <laughs> and in this very moving picture called Yarri Country by um, uh, Robert Thomas, the same way of dealing with this country through those geometric blocks was the same as Williams's, to give it that direct, stark simplicity. And the hidden story of this is so wonderful because it's Yarri is in fact the name of a poison billabong, which you can see in the two kind of rather milky uh, billabongs uh, at the, the top and the, the bottom. And he drinks of it, the man does, the Watucha man, and he sickens by it. And as he gets full sick, he thinks he'll light a fire to warm and comfort himself. The fire is out of control and rages, and he's killed and consumed in the fire. And as so often in those dreaming stories, what one is looking at is a tragic event in which the landscape is marked by a sense of tragedy as much as Nolan marked it, a sense of tragedy by that doomed explorer dragging his, 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 uh, his uh, camel uh, through the, the stones. But there's always that, that way in which there is a continuing figure in it and his club, which you can see here, his club is his kind of continuing presence in the land landscape itself. And I think one is very struck when one looks, as you do on the left-hand side, at a picture by Emily Nwawe, and on the right a picture by John Olson, painting of the loopy rivers of Cape York. And what Nwawe did was to say how essential it was to understand your dreaming if you are going to survive and help other members of your group, your tribe, to survive. Because, of course, her dreaming was the cam. It was the seed of the yams which grew underground. And her great theme in the early and middle part of her life was the tracing of the underground roots and sources of that yam, which in the rains, when they came, would grow and nurture and help the tribe to survive. And John Olson, in his kind of aerial view, as though he wants to see the hidden forces within the landscape, those rivers looping, as he says, around it, shaping the land. And in this comparison, I find that John Olson, who's very responsive to uh, other art, particularly admiring of contemporary Aboriginal art, here in a brilliant way, I think, sees that their dreaming can also be part of his dreaming as well. And there were others who were skeptical about the kind of Antipodeanism, the kind of allegorical landscape. And there are a younger generation of artists uh, who emerged in the 1960s, a very gifted one, who would see Robert Jackson's uh, Timbrel and Harp Soothes. Uh, now you can see it in the marvellous retrospective uh, in the Australian collection at Federation Square. And when Bob Jacks exhibited this picture in 1966 in Melbourne, I felt at last the 1960s, which had been going hell for leather overseas, finally arrived in Melbourne. A bit late, but they came. And the sheer vivacity of the picture, its wonderful kind of playful, fantastic abstraction, was simply a new voice on the scene. And a contemporary of his was Sid Ball, who, when he came back from New York and painted these very austere cantos, which had the great phrase, in great praise, as being their subtitle, even Sid could not quite stop the effect of that brilliant slash of yellow through the picture to really give you a sense of light and heat burning through uh, the canto itself. Then in the 1970s, post-1970, Australian painting has a very interesting history. It was around 1970 that you began to hear and read articles about the death of painting. Painting was over, one wanted to go to different things, photography, conceptual art, informal sculpture, performances, video, all of that was more relevant to contemporary art than painting was. 
Well, poor old painting, it's like the novel. People said the novel was finished 40 years ago. Oh, my God, it keeps on going. And similarly with painting. It may not have been in the forefront of, um, uh, of contemporary art, but there were these persistent images, persistent themes in Australian art post-1970, uh, which sustained it. This is Peter Booth in his painting 1977. When he exhibited, after being a very austere abstract painting, it was described as a painting which was of career suicide. To paint this extraordinary, emphatic, expressionist work in 1977. Well, it's interesting. It's that persistent of the expressionist element. Sometimes I think if you just rub or scratch a Melbourne painter, you'll find an expressionist underneath. And in this one, it is compelling. It is what the theme of the painting, which seems so difficult and so obdurate when it was first shown, so deeply irrational, is that of the compelled journey. The man who is a sort of surrogate figure for the artist must go on this journey to leave the burning city behind him. And his eyes burn with the flame which is seen and been confronted. And the key, I think, to this picture, this sense of heroic setting out on the compelled journey, is that wonderful painting of the dog. The dog is, of course, a pit bull, the ferocity of which is legendary. But it's also a white dog. And the white dog in the history of Western art has always been a symbol or sign of fidelity. And in this picture, a strange mixture of this man in the compelled journey being accompanied by this fiercest of all dogs who is also fiercely loyal to the figure on, on, on his journey. And the city, the painting of the city, that persists right through post-1970 in the narrative of Australian art. And one of its great ones is one of our uh, foreign sons, uh, Geoffrey Smart. But here he's at home. He's painting a uh, central uh, station in Sydney. And that strange sense of the kind of urban wasteland which he may have made his own. And the figure in some sort of panic, not just racing for a train, but fleeing for his life to animate the, the city. And in Melbourne, we had, and still have, thank God, the marvellous Jan Senbergs, whose map-like pictures of Melbourne have given us a new way, a new feeling of it. So I always say you, you mustn't try and find your auntie's home by looking at one of Jan's map pictures because you won't be able to find it. You'll get very lost. Because what he shows about the modern Australian city is it's both map-like, but it's a maze as well. And that great sense of the urban maze of being held together by these tentacles of roads which stretch, stretch across the urban fabric is exactly that of the great speed and velocity of the city, but also its maze-like uh, uh, quality. And the landscape. My God, does the landscape still persist uh, in uh, Australian painting post-1970? And it persists in a very interesting way in two artists, I think, who have made use of the notion of exploring the land still. And one is John Woolsey, which you see here. And John Woolsey, who goes out, like any of those early um, um, uh, artists recording um, uh, their um, particular interest, this is the most wonderful uh, title, which is Rare and Unexpected Sightings of the Embroidered Merops and the Spinifex Grass Wren, two birds. And the Merops was, in fact, known earlier to early colonial Australian as the Regent Honey Eater. But when John Lewin painted it in 1810, the early settlers recorded swarms of this um, uh, royal honey eater. Now they're rarely sighted, except in ones and twos. And you have to be like John Woolsey, you go out into the bush, be very quiet, and find them, the rare sightings. And they flitter through uh, this wonderful uh, set of drawings which are laced together to form a kind of panoramic landscape of the very feel of the land itself. The rare is detected and found and brought back to our consciousness. And the other one who took the theme of exploration as being the very key to Australian landscape is B. Maddock in her remarkable multi-panel work called Terra Spiritus with a darker shade of pale. And what she did was she made a set of drawings, or prints actually, uh, which were a complete circumnavigation of her native island of Tasmania. Uh, 
like the way in which Flinders and his artists made drawings of the circumnavigation of Australia in 1802. Except that what she does in the writing, which you can see here, she writes in a big, bold script across here, here too, she writes the names which the Aborigines gave to this coastline or to this rocky inlet which you see, see here. And down below, barely discernible, barely readable anymore, are the anglicised names for those places. Somehow she returns the land to its original owners by naming them, giving their names the great priority within the work. Some she uses the same materials, the kind of rough ochres and the striated patterns of Aboriginal art making. Well, all of this, in a way, is in the creation of consciousness, and how much in people like John Woolsey and uh, B. Maddock, our consciousness continues to be expanded by what these artists do. But just in closing, I want to say one of the great things about Australian art which I experienced from the very beginnings. And I first saw a Helena Rubinstein exhibition in 1960 in the old gallery up in Swanson Street. It was run by Charles Blackman. It had the wonderful people in it. John Brack was in it, Fred Williams, Roger Camp. And then they had the wild men from Sydney who painted abstract paintings to the great disapproval of Bernard Smith. But when you're 17, you're overwhelmed by all of it. And I remember there was a kind of an aura to the show which I've never completely lost from that show or from Australian art as a whole. And one of the great masterpieces of Australian art is Ian Fairweather's Monastery, which we're looking at now. It was painted in 1960-61, and 30 years earlier, on a visit when he was living in China, from Shanghai to Beijing, he stopped at the holy mountain of Taishou. And he climbed it in winter, and at the very top and summit of the holy mountain was this monastery. And they welcomed him in. And the monks fed him gruel and gave him shelter, otherwise he would have perished there and there and then on the holy mountain. And 30 years later, in Australia, on Bribey Island, he recalled this crucial experience of his survival and made this magic picture in which there seems to be both a chorus of voices and figures flitting in the doorways or just a series of openings and doorways of the temple itself which, uh, which he visited. And the even snowy quality of the thing, that kind of feathery grey which fluctuates through the painting recalls something of the snowy night in which he found, he sought and found uh, succour, survival even. Made a picture of kind of really of living, which we really feel the, the whole, that frame of being uh, is being uh, shown, held up and shown, shown to you. And elsewhere we have these wonderful pictures by Still Alive by John Brack, in which the war and conflict between pens and pencils becomes the surrogate for social tension and personal tensions. Us, we, them. The very strange title of the work in which, who, 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 which group do you belong to? Are you a pen or a pencil? Um, uh, and are us and we different? In which that sense of eternal social conflict, which I'm afraid is a lot of Australia and of any westernised, modernised culture, knows. Here, acted out on a tabletop for us, rather ironically. And lastly, Australian painters have me often been almost prophetic in which they have shown us about Australian um, landscape, society, and life. And I find in this William Robinson painting, A Dark Tide at Boganga, like a terrible warning to Australia about the effects of climate change. As though that great dark wave of the rising seas threatens to engulf us, even the viewer as we stand there, and the great storm-tossed sky above it. It is truly a frightening picture and prophetic of what may be our terrible future if we do not rectify it. So in all this, I hope I have, in a sort of terribly scandalous hop, skip and jumpkins way across Australian painting, tried to show you why I think Australian painting matters. Thank you.